Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by my old friend back on the show, Mr. Bruce Becker. Bruce, welcome back on. Thanks, Bart, for having me. So, Bruce, uh, this is a really neat one. You're previous episode was one of my favorites about Freddie Gruber, just because your impression of him (laughs) was just (laughs) like, I love, I think all the episodes have some humor in them, but that was one of the most just funny episodes I think we've, we've had on the podcast. So, uh, and a lot of people loved that. So I appreciate you again, coming on then and sharing your experiences about Freddie too. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I was on, I would say like the innermost orbit of Freddie Gruber's world and uh, not easy to get there. And uh, he ran you through, you know, hoops and hoops and hoops was a pain in the butt many times. But we had a very, very close relationship, as I may have stated in the previous podcast. You know, when I moved to Europe in 1992, after hanging with him for, oh, man, that would have been about 13 or 14 years, maybe, or 15, 14, Mm -hmm. 15. Anyway, he was heartbroken that I was leaving because... We hung a lot. I didn't study with him at that time. I would just go over to the house, get the food with him, hang and eat, a whole bunch of different things. Play for students. I played for so many students all the time, which was rather uncomfortable at the time. But I can look back now and understand the value of what he wanted me to demonstrate for them. And that loose approach came easy because I started with him at such a young age. And you know, you take that for granted. You're thinking about, oh, forget about that. I need to play some hip licks or something like that. And uh, so anyway, I moved to Europe. He was heartbroken and he showed up on my doorstep about, oh, let's say two months later, two and a half, somewhere in July. I got there in May and uh, I had to look after him. And then he came some successive trips where I'd look after him. We would do, we did a few drum clinics together. His drum clinics, you know, if you had ever seen one, they were, I, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but they were horrible. They were not very focused. They were all Jeez. over the place. Um, he really wouldn't play. I got him on one that I have uh, a videotape that I've converted to DVD. That is, I'll say for the record, is a pretty good Freddy. He was calm. I had to pepper him up the whole time we were driving to the clinic. It was in Germany. And I just stated emphatically over and over, these are guys are not going to get your shtick. So don't do your New York Bugs Bunny nonsense. Keep yeah. it real, man, and get to the point. And so the, the drag is, is on that recording my brother was filming. So he interrupted the recording from time to time because we had low battery. Mm-hmm. And as I recall, the reason for that was we didn't have a 220 converter oh, to like sure. keep the bar- battery charged up. Yeah. So, but we got about maybe an hour and 10 minutes of it. And I showed it to a few people who know Freddie and I've gotten like, wow, that was a pretty good Freddie, you know? So at some point, I don't know, you know, in my lifetime, I'll find a way to, you know, get some public viewing of it. I don't know exactly how it's my personal file. So I have no, you know, I'm not into cashing in. I just want to share it so people can kind of get it because there was a video that was out of a PASIC um, masterclass that he did. And I remember seeing it way back at the late 90s. And then I kind of went, wow, that was horrible, you know? And then one of my former students who had lived with Freddie, this guy's a great guy, David Bronson. He is the um, uh, product manager for the Istanbul Mehmet line. Cool. He also worked for many, many years with the um, Righteous Brothers. Anyway, he had that and he loaned it to me. And I remember watching it. It was the, the same response that I had when I first watched it. Actually, even more like, oh, my God, <laughs> covering my wow. eyes. And going, but but again, yeah. it was like, I think he had, you know, like performance anxiety. Well, he may have been a spectrum guy. Like now that I'm, you know, I'm a father of a kid on the spectrum and my daughter, I don't know what she has. She's being evaluated, but she might have ADHD. Like sure. a lot of kids have that stuff. And it's, yeah, of course, yeah. it's become more of an industry to have them evaluated. But as a result of that, and I look back at Freddie, go, he must have been on the spectrum. There must have been something that was not diagnosed because he was such a peculiar character, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Then it would just be more he's quirky or something like that. But, you know, and and we're going to talk about your book here in a minute. But yeah. it's interesting because someone um, I was reading something online. It just popped up something about Freddie Gruber might have been on one of the forums. And like someone said, because, you know, you can say anything you want on the Internet and it doesn't matter. Someone said, I just remember reading 
he didn't drum at all. He wasn't a drummer. He's kind of blah, 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 blah. It's all just like a myth. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, I don't think that's true. But I was like, I've never seen him play. I've never heard him. There's not a lot of videos. No. So it's an interesting thing to read that and go like, well, no, well, wait a minute, but I've never seen him. His his playing career would have probably stopped somewhere in the mid 60s or early 60s or so. And, you know, exactly like me doing my best due diligence to find people who would have been around him at that period of time. You know, there's mixed messaging. And, you know, a lot of the messaging, I'll say that, you know, Freddie Gruber was a great propagandist for that. But that aside, if we're talking, and I'm just going to go this analogy because you're living in my old town where I was born, brother, Cincinnati. <laughs> That's right. And yeah, I was a that. huge Reds fan. Oh, oh yeah. man. All for years and years and years. Yep. But um, if you go and you find a guy who is just an excellent, who just has excellent pitching coaching, um, uh, what do you say, uh, attributes, and he didn't make it in the majors, does that make him less of a guy? No. No. Uh, a batting instructor, not all those guys were able to go into the big leagues, you know, and hit 300 or 290. They knew the mechanics. They watched. They knew how to disseminate the information and give you some color and candor to what was going on mechanically with you. And that's what Freddie Gruber excelled at. So he did have that. And he used good imagination. I will say on the backside that, yes, that that for some people might lack, um, uh, um, what do you want to say, credibility because he didn't really play at those periods of time. But, sure. you know, I I could go anyway because I had this much of Freddie, you know, and I say all the spectrums. I'll still still say with an endearing voice and memory to that was, yeah, he had good insights and knew how to take observations of what was going on at the time and build it and format it for drummers at each particular time. If you go back to the 70s, he was very much into focusing on, you know, the click track and, and independence. And I think, you know, with his big ears, he would hear about a guy like Gary Chester or he certainly had the Gary Chafee uh, books, and those those were books that I went through when I was a kid with him. Um, all the literature, so he was kind of up on that. Later on, when he did move out of that little house uh, around 1984, uh, he did become less focused. And I could just say that factually because I was there. I watched him teach. so And I know the details of what I went through. I could pull down my books of seven years of studies and go through a great amount of detail of what I did. Now, I was a rare guy because not many people studied with him that long. So for me, we really tapped into the lanes that were most productive for my development, necessities. And, you know, I was, I don't want to say I was a hustling kid, but I was out there working young. I was teaching young. I was just out there doing what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't sit and practice and, and work it out and then go gig. You go and you work it out at the same time. There's no perfecting it. And then, oh, now I'm ready to do a gig. You get your ass kicked on a gig. You go yeah, out. For sure. You play in a big band. You go, man, my reading sucks. I got to figure out how to get that stuff together and how to feel more comfortable to set up the band. And then, of course, there's other styles that may be called upon. Yeah, so yeah. just relating to put a, sort of a cap on that. I'll say Freddie was a great observer. He was tapped in at that time. I think personally, if I just give my airing of it, he became a caricature, caricature of himself as he grew older. And I think just the ego is a funny thing. You have selective memory. You want to have this thing of, of what you did. He was sort of, I'd say, you know, like distant about his accomplishments in a funny way. But yet at the end, he had them all like on his uh, table in his house. Like I went there. The year he died, I went with my brother, and just a long story short, when I used to go back, because I had a falling out with Freddie about the late 90s, 99 mm -hmm. or so, and it was just time, 23 years, it was time to move it along. Yeah, sure. And when I would go, I'd bring my brother David, because David was close with Freddie, too. And I would um, come to the door, he'd open the door, he'd look at David and go, David! He'd give him a big <laughs> hug, and then he'd look at me, and he'd brow over his glasses, hey, man! <laughs> 
And it would take him about an hour and a half or so to kind of loosen up and get back. So the last time I was there, I actually filmed some stuff and I filmed his table and he had all the little articles and different things that he had done through his career because I think internally he knew he was, you know, checking out. And yeah. it was that later that year that he had passed. But, oh, man. Um, you know, again, I think he became a character um, for better or for worse. You know, he just he was, like I said, a great propagandist. He got his name out there. People know there's two camps. They hate him or they love him. Yeah. Um, yeah. I say I'm somewhere in the middle. I love him. I hated him. But at the same time, I saw the value of what he was able to project. Yeah. And you had that experience and not that many people had it. And it's a part it's it, you can't change that. It's a part of you. No, um, dude, it's it's sitting in my fascia <laughs> material underneath the skin. Yeah. It's like, you know, can't, can't yeah. get rid of it. So, so if you want to hear everyone listening, if you haven't heard it much more, I looked it up. It's episode 86 from February 2021. Um, wow, that's almost two years ago uh, to the day, which wow, is pretty you're wild. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, to this day of recording, this will be out next week. But um, so check that out. It's, it's Bruce's experience with Freddie Gruber, and it just cracks me up. The entire episode <laughs> was hysterical. But so, Bruce, today we're here, though, to talk about uh, your new book that's coming out. And I want to yes. also want to talk about your work with Drumeo and all this cool stuff you've been doing. Sure. But yep. Uh, the book is The Ultimate Guide to Syncopation, Concepts for the Development of Motion, Melody, and Independence, which is referring to the classic progressive steps to syncopation for the modern drummer book, a.k.a. Yes. syncopation. Right. Um, just explain it to us. What 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 is the book? And, um, and then we'll dig in deeper from there. Okay. So what I did was going through a myriad of different materials and looking for like the perfect bo book that would have this concept or this concept. And I have, as you see up here, a pretty extensive collection of books. Yeah. Uh, more than most, not as many as some. I have a couple of students who have a million books, like my student sure. Steve Hatfield, who actually hooked us up uh, That's two right. years ago. Yes. Or my former student, Ralph Johnson, the original drummer from Earth, Wind & Fire, who's still with Earth, Wind & Fire. He just doesn't drum. He plays percussion. He's in the front line with Philip Bailey and Verdine White uh ralph is a consumer of books too so anyway i was looking for different materials and i started to go through just different sections of the book now most people would know like the heart and soul of most syn syncopation conceptual ideas are built off of pages 34 to 45 or in the old printing 33 to 44 mm -hmm. and i've touched upon and heard a great deal from many students through the years of different things they may have done, like via Alan Dawson or whatever, whoever. Freddie had his few lanes that he chose. And I started to look through different books for different things that I thought were crafty ways of developing further independence or further ways of conceptualizing movement and phrasing and uh, or role studies, which I got a great deal of from that. And all of a sudden, I was like using not the whole book, but way more of the book than what you'd normally use. Hmm. And so at one point in 2021, I'm trying to think back, was it 2021? No, it was 2020 <laughs> pandemic. I was busy sure. because I was teaching all the time. I teach online yep. and for many years, I've just, I was very fortunate that I was doing it before the pandemic and able to sustain my normal workload. In fact, increase a bit and just do what I do. And um, I was thinking, geez, you know, I got to write a book, got to write another book. So I have a first book that's called Puzzles, Rhymes and Riddles. If you don't know it, it's a great book. Go get it. I'm sorry I didn't promote it a lot, but it is a fabulous book. It is available digitally through Hudson. It is available hard copies through me. Cool. And that's a cool book. But as I was sitting there in 2020, I contacted one of my students, uh, this guy, Tim Carmen. And Tim is also an author. author. He also has a great band called GA20 based out of Boston. They are killing it. They are a retro bluesy kind of roots band, two guitars and drums. And I also introduced him to Hudson and he got his uh, second book uh, distributed through Hudson via the uh, download version. And he, I think he still has access to the hard copies. He just wrote another book for Hudson called Haynesism. It's all about Roy Haynes. So, as I was thinking about my concept, I said, ah, maybe I should talk to Tim. I'm not a notation guy. 
I don't have a software. <laughs> so I called him up. I said, Tim, here's what I'm thinking. I've got this idea for a book. Would you be interested in doing the layout for me? Because I have a lot of confidence in your ability to make it look great and really do a great layout. You've seen the layout, so yeah, you can awesome. speak firsthand on that. Very cool. And um, and then my second my second statement to him was, I might be a little bit slow and a pain in the butt, but we'll get it done. <laughs> so that was 2020. Now it's just coming out like soon. I, I know I haven't received a proof proof copy yet, but it's it's coming out soon. So here we are in February. It should be out probably in late March, I would imagine, or, or maybe April at the latest, but it's coming out soon. And it will be available in hard copy. It will be available digitally. And there are, I believe I put together 35 videos to talk through points in different sections. I didn't do a video for every exercise. That was too daunting. Sure. And I just wanted to give some conceptual in point, uh, uh, input and as I say, with these kind of exercises, it's the concept, not the content. So I didn't want to explode with like, you know, excessive amount of content. And each video, in fact, is actually a little lesson in breaking things down and not just my performance of it. So I really wanted to make sure that I was very expressive and breaking down everything to such a degree that somebody gets it, you know, because a lot of people are visual learners. It's not easy to conceptualize things yes. and just look at a book and go, what do I do with this book? So syncopation is one of the books that I've worked through. I was taking lessons with Barry James, who is one of Stone's students. And I, Barry and I are good friends. I kind of stopped my lessons because of kid stuff, but I worked through syncopation. I didn't grow up as a big book guy. I worked through a few as a kid. But I need the visual aid. I need what you did to kind of help me get through it because I didn't have that like re like extreme, you know, book background with re with reading. So I think what you did with adding that it's it's also like, why not? We live in this modern era. Why not sit with this? It's more work. It's more effort. Well, but it just really helped. Well, so, you know, uh, David Garibaldi was a student of mine for a good two and a, maybe about a half years and then a little bit in 2012, but mostly after his accident. And um, he was working on his book, DG's Notes, that uh, I have just talked to him like about a week ago. And he said, oh, man, I was like a number one seller for Hudson on the number one list. Hmm. I said, you got it. I mean, no better educator slash iconic drummer than David Garibaldi for me. I mean, he embodies everything. Uh, the quintessential yeah. student, uh, author slash uh, teacher and innovator. Sure. So that being said, when I was talking to him, maybe it was not last year, could have been and asking him about that. And I said, did you do the videos on your own? Well, apparently he was telling me he was trying to work on that and got Final Cut and a DSLR and all that stuff. And he said his head was blowing up. And he said, eventually, Rob said, let's just go to the studio, man, and do it yeah. that way. And then they sent all his videos. And I think Joe Bergamini might have done the editing. I'm not sure if yeah. for 100% I mean, sure on that. But, each of those is a career that someone has, is video editor. Well, you know, so yeah. when I talked to Rob and I said, listen, man, I don't really have time to like do a high end thing. And he said, did you see Steve Gadd's thing? I said, yeah just like one camera he goes you don't need like that's the 90s of like you know lights camera action he said you need to have a good camera with a good room good audio and one of my students who looked at the book because i was sending it around to have a few guys give me some feedback he said you know what i love about it he goes man the videos it's like you're in your studio you're just talking just like you are it's not a high-end production thing i'm, I'm here <laughs> this yeah. is my workplace that's it and um, it was really, um, it was fun, but agonizing because when you're talking to yourself and you're looking at expressing things very articulately, that, you know, that's going to be an imprint forever. You know, there's no take backs once you got it out there. Well, you could add things later on, but you know what I mean? You're, you're putting oh, yeah. it out there. It's like recording. It's like recording a record. You want yeah. things to sit and sparkle. Some days I would flow and kick butt. And some days I'd come out here and I'd spend an hour and I'd go like, I can't put that out there. It would be like, blah, blah, you know, tripping over <laughs> yeah. your tongue and, yeah. and messing up a sticking or whatever it was. It was, sure. it was, you know, something. So to just sort of speak about it, what I did is I took those videos and I went through different sections and give a lot of insights to what's going on. So there are a role section where I really detail the movement of roles. I think that 
choreographing your movement that was part of my drumio technique course was main thing that i did i didn't do the inside of the hand things those exercises take my observation skills because i've really been doing this stuff for 42 years it that kind of stuff is really best when i'm a, a coach sure. but movement you can talk about it at least in theory i know a lot of guys who took that course like don't know how to pronounce his last name, but I think it's David Osakinen or Osakinen. He's the drummer for the band, the Hooters. They had a big hit called and we dance, I think it's called. And they were like okay. featured on the, the big, um, what was that big AIDS thing that they did? The world thing in 1985 oh, sure. where they had stages live in aid and stuff. Yeah. Live yeah. aid, live aid. Yeah. Thank you. And so, he was telling me because we were corresponding my my drum technique course with drumio which is still available was my at that point i was personally involved because we ran it live two years in a row and it was phenomenally successful but i had interactions with him and he said dude you're just killing me my chops feel great and he was going to work with some roots guy in nashville and he said it's killing and I said, thank you for the good feedback. You know, yeah. I got a lot of it from other people, but I bring him up because he's a guy who's out there working. And it's lovely always to see the impact you can have on the older generation, because those are the guys who maybe have suffered greatly from bad technical approach. Yeah. But so back to my book, what I did is I broke down the roles and all the different uh, arrangements of that and purposely slow. If you can play this slow, like moving like Tai Chi, then you're going to get a better essence of how to really tap into the flow. Everybody has a momentum that you can kind of find, but that doesn't mean you have good control of the range of, I would say, more to the point of backsiding it and going slower than worrying about speed. But once you're tracking and seeing how things move slowly, that will actually root itself in such a way that when you're playing fast, your mind's eye your tracking mechanism will be spot on and your ability to see the movement at the fast tempo now will be undaunted it will be smooth and fluid sure. takes a little bit longer there's no instant potatoes and if you had them they taste like paste <laughs> right grow True. a potato take the time to grow the potato and put it into a place where you go okay one of my students had a great line i'd never heard this one before but he said don't practice for perfection practice for permanence that's smart yeah so that's Very what smart. i'm kind of orchestrating here now that was one section of the book i did the body of the syncopated exercises from page 34 to 45. i did a bunch of arrangements of things that are jazz oriented i would say maybe some people out there have seen a couple but not all, because I've had guys who've studied with the variety of guys who were more known about using syncopation. And when I demonstrated my version, they go, oh, wow, I never saw that one before. Hmm. And so I was very kind of like feeling, okay, that was before I started to think about the book. And then writing the book, I felt really confident about that. I also did some things that were inspired and I gave my props to, I have one section that I call the Elvin Jones. It was my uh, inner workings of breaking down systems and arrangements of things that could get you closer to the identity of what Alvin was noted to be doing. Okay, I don't want to say I'm going to turn you into an Alvin Jones, but you don't want to be Alvin Jones. You want to be you. No, but, but you, you can practice take... his style and then put it right. in your own. Yeah, yeah. I did in that same section some Brazilian arrangements. Mm -hmm. I took earlier sections and just did simple rock and roll patterns, things that I would have worked on with my younger kid students that were not really to have a ready to have a conversation about technique. The last thing you want to do with a kid is barrage them with, hey kid, you know, let's do <laughs> all these technical exercises. Sure, they want to sure. play. They want and rock. of course, yeah, you got to like pull their teeth out a little bit to find out where they're at. Yeah, but I would do these things that, that had uh, an element of reading, simple reading, and I'd say, all right, so you're going to play every note that falls on one and three will be a bass drum and every note that will be on two and four, it's a snare drum. And we're just going to play straight eighth notes and let's play that pattern and just play. And now you're playing a rock pattern. So I started to use that. And then at the end of the book, uh, around page 56 in the newer printing, now I use a couple setups that are a little earlier than that in the page in the 50s, but 56. I discovered a way of now these could also be implemented to pages 34 through 45. But 
I wanted to literally have somebody see the phrase with the accents and work on it hand to hand triplets. But I added a whole range of different things again to really tap into phrasing. If you're thinking about phrasing and you're just clapping or tapping your toes or snapping your finger on two and four and you're going, I want two, three, four. Of course, I'm going to be a little bit, you know, jazz oriented, but I'm going to say, do ba, ba, do ba, dee, and dee, ba, do, and da, ba, do, ba, 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 do, ba, do, ba. Those are all the jazz eighth notes that you'd want to interpret. You go to triplets, let's go like a long range of eighth note triplets. Three, one, two, three, four. But zuba didn't da da and then we want to go a didn't and play sixteenth notes. Yeah. The point is, we want smooth transitions, gear shifting without grinding the clutch. So I did this whole melodic thing at that section, breaking it down with different moves and orchestrating it different ways, which is stuff that I would use again. You go through the larger plan of action to draw into the concept and you try to find the you and what you do. And so those are like pretty much like the main points of the book. And then the last thing I did was just an independent thing of ostinatos, just as Terry Bozio would have laid out. And I formulated just a visual cue of how it would look into the interpretation. So in essence, I make page and number references so you can see, but those uh, in my book are the actual way that I would write it out so you can see. Hmm. So if you got a good imagination, and I say at the uh, forward of the book, your imagination is not only required, but requested. And if you can put some spins on the imagination and add to what you're doing, Absolutely. You want to keep a chalkboard up here where you can sort of draw out your own plans of action and allow that to build upon who you are rather than just working on a lick. Work on a concept of building up. How would I play this in my own way? Or, you know, like like all the great guys that I love, like Neil Peart, what an original guy. No more original than that. David Garibaldi, no more original than that. Alvin Jones, who we just spoke about, or Tony Williams, or Stuart or Stuart Copeland, you know. Like voices that you go, well, that's Stuart Copeland, or yeah. that's Neil Peart. That exactly. is absolutely, you know, Alvin Jones. Yeah. Undeniably. Yeah. So. Well, let me ask you. All right. So going back kind of uh, to the beginning of all this, do you think people need to have experience playing through syncopation on their own before they jump into your book to kind of like no. have it make sense? Or should you work with them side by side? Or can you just get your book? Because it seems like, to me, syncopation is not the most difficult. It can be difficult. You can always make things more difficult, especially when you get to like, I remember working through it and getting into like the last, uh, one of the last exercises. And it was like, okay, this just got hard. Like right. there's a, there's one page in particular. It was like, oh my God, that's a different story. Um, but you can really work your way through it relatively easily without a ton of experience. Um I would say for like syncopation from my standpoint, it's it's black and white. Yeah, that's a good you way to want you want somebody to come in with crayons and go like, well, let's color this in with blue. Yeah. Let's add a little red. Yeah. And what I want you to do is take your colors, your crayons, and come in. Now, what I did with my guide was to say, like, hey, here is some really great exercises to bring you forward with what you want to do conceptually. Now, conceptual playing is harder in that you're on your own to a degree. I always use this story. You know, the greatest thing I got to do was be a part of an original band. For 35 years, I recorded with my brother David. We had a trio, the David Becker Tribune. We recorded real records with real labels and went out on the road and got airplay and all that stuff that we would do. And when you're in that um, creative zone, you go and you're like, my brother's a great composer and he would write stuff and it would be six drummers would pop into my head of how I wanted to, you know, sound. But yet I don't really sound like those guys. I sound like me. And sometimes you'd want to play way too much. Okay. In a studio setting, you might have a producer. But sorry, I was the producer along with David, and my brother would give me a lot of free reigns in probably 90% of the cases. So when you're on your own, you're trying to figure out, you know, what you want to do and be the best editor of what you do in terms of constructing this soundscape of what you're putting together. Sure. Not easy. And I think 
that is what you know you can find out what to play you go to youtube and you're going to see a million things of what to play you're not going to see necessarily how to play it how to move that's one thing that can bring you a whole new opening once you start to feel the mechanics just be a natural part of what you do all of a sudden your imagination starts to kick in but my point is is that digging up and trying to be a conceptual drummer and find your own voice and dig deep not easy because we want to sound like that guy and we want to sound like that guy and you do build your playing off that but so important so i would go back to saying in the construction of my book i give the guideline that's why it's an ultimate guide i'm giving you the guide of like hey look at this section look at this section and then once you've gone through those add to the conversation mm -hmm. lift your own uh concepts forward and go like hey bruce uh i love that but look what i did with this yeah because i i didn't even do uh, mathematically you could go forever and at some point you have to sort of step back and go like all right that's enough you know because you can go like <laughs> yeah. endlessly with ideas yeah. sure. i mean it's it's ridiculous and at the same time you know you got to snap into snap back into reality what is going to be functional for playing and all that stuff so there's yep. you know you can go nuts you can kind of keep balance i tried to stay more balanced with the idea of the book the thing that pops to my mind though is like this book syncopation is obviously one of the top drum books of all time i mean it no, is probably number two probably right, number two behind, behind, stick, control. behind yeah. stick control this yeah. is i mean those two have a very special place um so what was your experience with first learning in syncopation and maybe explain a little bit about what you know what you thought was missing to get to your book where you filled in a lot of that stuff and modernized it well it had so much um uh conceptual uh food in there for me to draw from and i i've used it for so many years and like i said when i was looking at different books as time went on instead of buying a new book i started to just pick sections and i went geez this is a perfectly great section now you got to conceptualize it mm -hmm. to take on the idea of okay we're going to do roles with this or we're going to do this with that and you know joe morello did that with stick control he was a stu a stone student so he kind of did that i'm just taking like i said again crayons and giving you crayons yeah to good to add colors but i did more extensively different sections to draw upon the things that i found that i didn't want to have like say okay get this book and get this book and this book and this book instead of getting five or six books where you might work out of only a small section you know as i've gone through teaching i've edited like little sections of things in fact you know one of the things i'm going to be doing at the end of march is i'm going up to film some stuff for drumeo mm -hmm. and i'm going to be doing topically a thing about method books and speaking about my interpretations because that was the one thing that i got from gruber nicely is that he would take a book and he would build a conceptual approach around it that may not have been exactly the point of the guy. And, you know, in most cases, if you go to a method book and the guy's not on the planet anymore and you're going like, well, I don't know, you're just going to hear a bunch of interpretations from a bunch of different people. So why not add your approach or your conceptual approach to it as well? I'll say as well, if you do get a method book, rather than feeling like it's a daunting affair and like oh my god i got to start on page one go and look in the middle of the book look at the end of the book find something that speaks to you and see oh you know that would be something good if i worked on that because that's lacking in my play and at the end of the day while you are always looking for a mentor a teacher a coach to help assist you on your path you also have to be very self-reflecting and be able to evaluate where you are. So, but back to the top, I just brought in stick control because it's the, I started with that book back in 1972, hmm. my first teacher, I was working out of, you know, <laughs> the simple phrase is going, what, and two, three, four, yeah, yeah. one, two, and three, and then the 16th notes. And then after that book, we went into the Emil Scholl book, which was a orchestral book, kind of a rudimental orchestra book and the Buddy Rich book. And then the Buddy Rich book, we broke down the rudiments. And for the uh, Emil Scholl book, that was just straight up reading. And uh, what what I'll tell you about what, what I liked about the conceptual thing for playing jazz in uh, uh, Ted Reed was that when I went into a big band, when I was a kid, I, I couldn't I couldn't read that. It's strange, too, because I could read on a snare drum, 
put me on a snare drum and give me snare literature. And I was a very good reader. Put me with a big band and put that chart up there. Not a lot of notation, a lot of bars of, of repeat to play time and then some figures, nothing sure. daunting. But my ears would go back to the band and I'd be listening to the band and my eyes would freeze on bar one. So they might be on bar 63 and I'm still like, a, I don't know where I am, but I'm listening to the band. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. and then suddenly the tune would end and, uh, you know, I'd kind of like, uh, oh, and I'd look <laughs> at the at the notation and I kind of go like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I made some error, like trying to yeah. look like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> oh, let me mark that for next time. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So but, you know, going through those syncopated figures, when I finally got into college and was in the big band, I go, wait a minute, I can do this. I just got to keep my eyes moving like I know how to do on the snare drum and keep my ears open at the same time. So that was very valuable. And again, going back to just that blue covered book, man, I think I've had about five or six of the copies of that book. They always tend to sort of fall apart because I'm always open and ripping yeah. and turning. And, uh, but it is the number two method book behind stick control. I, I, I say, I say respectfully, I think it's number two. It might maybe in some polls, it would be number one, but I think stick control because of the value of that and going through all that. And I still with stick control, I think people get stuck on pages five, six, and seven, man, sure. I got a whole concept of going through other parts of the book and bringing about some understanding of movement. But you look at my book first for the movement, and then you can go into stick control and you can tackle some of those role studies or single stroke studies. I would say more my book would kind of gear you more towards the role studies in stick control, which are great yeah, and, yeah. and absolutely imperative to go through. Well, and even the um, what syncopation, I even love just the the look of it and the notation <clears throat> style where it's almost looks like a marker. It kind of the way it's written now is just very like approachable. And uh, I love having your mod more modern style with yours of, of reading. And and I got to tell you, so my background, again, I, I took lessons for a long time, but my I just didn't keep up with reading. It's always felt like something that I need to I need to get back into. And I was working on it. And then you have another kid and it's just but I, I have the ability, the freedom. I've played drums my whole life. I could sit and play. But deep down inside, you know that it's like I just need to work on my reading. I feel like we all have something that we want to work on. Yes. And get better. And it's good. We always need something to do that. I mean, I have that with the podcast. I have that with this. But I look forward to I've watched through your, some of your videos and things that you sent me with your book. But it's really nice to have the ability to have a professional master teacher where I can rewind you and I can start it over. And also from a financial standpoint, you buy your book. Let's say you buy Bruce's book once and then you get all those lessons that you can restart as many times as you want that's the new frontier man of how we yeah. do things you know yeah so you can then go back and start over and things like that so i'm really looking forward to that but i did i did want to touch upon one thing you said sure. about reading yeah what i found just just as a, a a broad topic of reading what i found was the key for reading for me was that when you look at one book and it has a specific font and you get familiar with that and you now have dissected the mathematical arrangements of the rhythmic element. When you go to another book and the font changes, it can be disorienting at first. Absolutely. You know? And math is the same. But when you go through enough different reading materials, I think that's when you start to stabilize your reading and go, aha, OK, now I'm in there. And that's how I formulated. I just kept reading books. I mean, yeah. I went through the Podemsky book with Gruber. I went through the Wilcoxon book, the All-American Drummer with Freddie. Um, and then I would sit and read through those books after the fact, because, you know, your eyes need to be always conditioned to follow the arrangement of math. Uh, I went through the Nard book. I got a book by Mitchell Peters that was called Odd Time Rudimental Etudes, a great book. It's like Wilcoxon, but it's all in odd time. And then my masterpiece of book that was shared with me with one of my students about 23 years ago is this book called The Contemporary Percussionist by Charles Memphis. Mm -hmm. And that in some section is like stick control on steroids. I'm sorry, uh, Ted Reed syncopation on steroids. And there's some challenging reading materials in there. And so I've been using that book and tearing it apart similarly to how I would use something like Ted Reed. Hmm. And it, in that, it really puts the reading element together and all the conceptual building blocks of certain stickings, because there are no stickings written in there. 
I always say the greatest greatest thing about the Wilcoxon book, every sticking is written in there. But what's <laughs> yeah. the worst thing about the Wilcoxon book? Every sticking is written in there because you yeah. have no chance to develop maybe a couple of different options for flow. You know, you might go, yeah, he's got that one, but I don't know, that doesn't work for me. And you want to be able to slice it up a few different ways. So what sure. I do is I do this whole building block of arrangements. And then you look at this Memphis book and you go, oh, my God, you mean I could do that sticking in there? Yeah. And you could also do this one, too. And it'll add to a flow. Hmm. So, but overall, for the reading, a multitude of different fonts. And when I worked in the studios with different writers, man, sometimes you'd get a chart that was a chocolate mess, but it had all the math right. It's just the guy had just terrible, you know, writing skills and you can't beef and complain about it. You got to like step up to the game or they're not going to call you back. So, yeah. you know, I didn't do like, you know, thousands of sessions, but I did, a you know, in the hundreds sure. of, for different guys and reading. And thankfully, I was called back. Those were great challenges. But, you know, you're going to read. You got to read. You just got to oh, yeah. do it. You got to make time to do it. Yeah, you know? that's awesome. Um all right, so the book is not out yet, though. Do we have a time that we want to tell people that, you know, they can look forward to getting it? It's with Hudson, so with digital, Hudson, yeah. hard copy. When when can people look forward to um, getting it? I'm just going to guess. I'm going to say probably somewhere in March because, okay. like I said, I'm expecting to get a proof copy, and, uh, and then it's off to the printing presses. So, and I know that I've been speaking with... Uh, rob and al uh kind of coordinating a few things and then i'm just waiting for a, a proof copy i haven't really reached out this week i will but i would just say keep your eyes and ears open i will definitely you know put a little social media stuff out there and say hey the book is ready and i'll be doing some uh maybe another podcast or two in the future yeah. uh promoting it you know i'll post it on the usual suspects in the social media areas via just me why don't you give people maybe an example uh we didn't really sure. plan which one we sure. would do but like what do you think is a good like taste let's take a look if you go to the original book the syncopation book page yep. 16 and i reference that in my book okay. it's in the rules section the first section and i'm going to play just taking those eighth note triplets and reinterpret them to double stroke roll so every eighth note triplet now will be a double when I'm playing the eighth notes, just the regular eighth notes, they'll stay in single notes, but I'm going to have a very large choreo choreographed move to build up a fluidity of motion. Now, I'm playing eighth notes right now, and I break this down in my book with the video and also just the notation. If I'm playing down, tap, down, tap, down, tap, down, so this would be one and two and three and four and. Okay, in that setting, you can clearly see that I am playing all these lifts and drops in a molar style method. With mm -hmm. my left hand, I'm playing a wrist-driven tap stroke. And what I want to do is build upon the fluidity of those two movements. That's one part of it. Couple it with the roll. If I take the triplets, I would have, I'll do this in a very, very slow way, but I would have a pivot catch for my downstroke double, a drop and a pull, and then a tap stroke double. That would just be wrist-driven, and I would say it could be a bounce to a catch. So if I play just a successive amount of eighth note triplets with the doubles, I would have pivot catch drop pull double, pivot catch drop pull double, one, two, three, and leave four and leave. Now that's playing it as eighth note triplets. We're going to now take that maneuver and superimpose it over eighth note triplets. So now every double will be an eighth note triplet. So it'll be one and leave two and leave three and leave four and leave one. So if I play that first one, I would have. And I could also just break down just for minutia, the count is 16th note triplets, mm. which I do. And the count is 16th note triplets that was passed to me was passed from Louis Belson. I was a student of Henry Belson, Louis's brother, and we did Louis's method books. So the count was one ya any ya, two ya any ya. That's how we broke down 16th triplets. And I think it's oh so important to count, to learn to count, but also to track and find a way to speak out the choreographed movement. So I'll do it two ways. I'll play it down, up, up double, and down, tap, down, tap, one, e -a, and e -a, two, and three, and four, and down, up, up double, down, tap, three, and four, and one, e -a, and e -a, two, and three, 
and four and. Now that with that specific one, the cool factor is, is that you're having basically uh, this um, choreographed move and orchestrating it in a large frame way. So super cool. That's really challenging to do when you're moving slow and you're getting your movement and flow together. Hmm. Then you're really starting to tap into orchestration of movement, choreographing your movement, tracking how it works. You're going to make a lot of progress with that. Everybody wants to get to the punchline. How do I play fast? And yeah, I think sure. multitudes of teachers in the past would say emphatically, play it slow. Learn to play of slow. Course. And then you will, you know, be able to move quicker. If I do move quick, though, things would change in, in spirit of movement. So, and I also do that with the 16th notes. If I take the pages of 22 and 23, for example, they're kind of laid out the same way with the 16th note. Now be converting into 32nd notes, that same eighth note movement. One thing I didn't speak about though, with these eighth notes bar is when I'm playing these, if I'm saying down, tap, down, tap, or with the left hand lead, down, tap, down, tap, I'm only accounting for 50% of the movement because inside my lift, to set up the down, I got to also think about that smooth lift. And to get my tap stroke, there's also a return, a turn stroke. So if I focus on just this section of the movement of down, tap, down, tap, let's reverse it. Let's do all the non notes, the movements. I would have up, right, and turn. Right. So it would be down, tap, down, could be up, turn, up, turn, up, turn, up, turn. And when you're doing those things, you might have reflexive resistance with your arms and add more anatomy than you need. We want to focus on inducing a great relationship with what hinge needs to work, being super effective and efficient. Sure. So each of those sections of the roles, I'm pretty detailed in the videos to help to orchestrate what's going on so that you're not left going like, what, down, up, tap, what, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, and yeah. You go through it multitudes of times. Maybe my fur or your first impression might be, oh, well, okay, gotta, I gotta watch what's going on. But in terms of leading somebody with a directive, you might give them four or five directives to process. Human mind can process one, maybe two. But once you get the one, you go, oh, now there's that other thing he was talking about. Oh, there's yeah. that other thing. And before you know it, you're starting to speak clearly. But I gotta just say, like in that section, slow and slow because it's not easy to orchestrate this kind of movement with that kind of fluidity of lifting and dropping and look at the natural motion of the hinge in my elbow the release i got to work on not over releasing my wrist i've got to calibrate my lift to also stay rooted to the sweet spot of the stick tip and not drop prematurely over the tip of the tip and all sure. those little things that you see people do and you go like that's an easy fix. That's an easy fix. You got to fix that. You can fix that. And that's what I do in terms of the greater scheme of my technical breakdown. I have so many little building blocks and back pocket ones. If I run into a wall with somebody, I can go to the left or to the right because of the experience with so many different students and trying to figure out, I have a clear picture of what I want to get out of them. Yeah. In other words, Okay, I need to go here. But if that line is not clean with them, I may have to go here to get to here. Well, everyone's different. Everyone Absolutely. learns differently and you've got enough experience. And that was incredible. And it's it's that was obviously a very like, you know, like condensed version of yes, like here's yes. what's happening. You obviously are beyond just doing this book and shooting the videos, a very uh, busy working teacher. So I think yes. people yeah. watch that and they say, wow, I need to study with this guy. Are you accepting new students? Can people reach oh, out to you? Yeah, and yeah. I always have a mirror. You know, things like I have a turnover that that kind of moves slowly. I'm very blessed that I have a very full schedule week to week, have had for many, many years. But, you know, at one point, a guy that's been with me for three years, it's time for him to move on and do something. Yeah. And I, a lot of the guys, I, I can't say the exact percentage, but I'm going to guess about 70% of people that approach me stay for a good year and a half or two years some longer wow. uh, if you really want to build like good conduit to how you can readdress your movement and get a flow you have to like really get inside what's going on so the habitual movement before is able to be pushed to the side and you know that takes time older guys really lock in and they get kind of stiff they might have some atrophy 
in the wrist or some problems in the forearm or some, you know, disconnected fingers from the body of the stick or the grip and all those little fine tuned nuances of inside the hand. I have really highly fine tuned little exercises. You're not going to see them anywhere. And you might see some guys trying to do it sure. in certain ways. I'm not going to speak on everybody's behalf, but I'll tell you that I've never seen anything more detailed than how I can get things to really manifest and shape that hand to that position of drawing upon the resonant tone of acoustics and maximum efficiency with all the bang for your buck of what you need. I want looseness, but I always say loose with density. You could say, oh, you're too tight, loosen up. That's not going to affect somebody. If you go through a myriad of little stretching and pressure point exercises, that will have an effect. How fast will it infiltrate your playing? Well, I can just tell you timeline. I can tell a lot of guys, they may not get the literal translation of a certain exercise, but they'll come back, you know, the next lesson or maybe in four lessons and they'll go, I was playing. It felt different. Mm. I, I felt the stick in a different way. And I go, exactly. Yeah. More to come. Keep working Takes on time. it. Takes time. Absolutely. Do you, do you find, um, uh, do you, I've done one or two online lessons and, um, and it was with my friend Barry and uh, Barry does a great job, but I, it was, I think it was more me being able to like, Set, I, I, it was before I had like an actual camera set up as a webcam and it was all this. Do you find that you can really see people's hands and, and, and address? Oh, I'm sure you run into issues with like, no, yeah, I, I, mean, I can see the finest tuned little movement when the shoulder kicks in or the guy's elbows tight or it moves out like that. I could see every nuance about that. And what I do in my private teaching is I make videos of the lesson not the full lesson but little exercises they're usually condensed down to about three or four minutes so we get to the bullet points um i do that and my my comment to everybody is those are for your personal use not to be shared shown or broadcast in any capacity i'm trying to make inroads to your playing i'm not yeah. speaking to other people i'm speaking to you sure everybody honors that as far as i know i haven't seen anything flying around on the internet regarding that but i did that as a mechanism that in the early days of what you just spoke about, where I did have problems, where the internet was far less stable and very disruptive with Wi-Fi, and I got hip like about two years into doing this because I started in 2014. 13 actually was like a trial because I thought, you can't do this online. You got to do it in person. And then I was doing a lot of stuff for Drum Channel, and I was getting guys from different parts of the world or the country. And uh, it's the only medium. So yeah, Skype yeah. was really horrendous at the time. So what I would do True. is if we were out of sync, as I go, hang on, let me do this exercise. I'm going to film it. I'm going to email it to you. You're going to do it. I'm going to watch you. And I don't even have to see if you're in sync. I just need to see how you're moving uh -huh. because I don't even need the sound. I know what the exercise is, and I can tell if you're moving late, early, uh, five bars ahead, 16 notes behind. I can see every single thing. And then that became like, wow, that's a really trusted ally. I can really make greater progress with people and push them ahead to a much faster level. Okay, fast, faster than what I could do before in the old days. Yeah, sure. At the same time, again, you do nothing, you get no result. You follow my lead and you start to develop a little bit of a discipline. You know, it takes a little time to sit down and see these guys and go oh yeah i gotta sit down and just you know work them out because yeah. again nothing comes from doing nothing uh, that so, is so true i try yeah. to hold my students as accountable as i can i'm not gonna browbeat them i don't think yelling at anybody or being you know a, a, a jerk about it is going to draw any good response just like we learn as parents <laughs> If we scream at the kid, it doesn't really do much. No. So, you know, and I would say, like, in my teaching, I got patience and visual um, uh, responses to seeing and, and uh, being able to uh, bring forward my messaging and concept to such a nice, fine degree. And then you go have your kids, and those te patients are tested to the 10th degree. <laughs> yeah, but I've learned through the teaching, too. I go, geez, how come I could be so patient when this guy is struggling like minute after minute, and I could just stay laser sharp focused and get him through that? Do that with the kids? Yeah, you know, I'm about that's a 50, different story. 50, 50, yeah. 50, you know? Yeah, but people are <laughs> trying. And and that's, I would say, when, when people are putting an effort 
they're they're not having fun either. I mean, they're having fun, but you know what I mean. No one wants to struggle with anything, and, and to be yelled at doesn't help anything. But um, no, no, I think that's an antiquated, old school way of teaching. So again, I've modified that, but the internet value has become so good. All I do is I just say, on your end, have at least a laptop. Don't look at me on a phone. Yeah, it's too small. No, or a tablet. And then if you can, if you're on a laptop. You know, get an Ethernet cable and plug into your modem totally. and get rid of the Wi-Fi. Check so, your speed beforehand. That's super I, important. I yeah, always do, man. I get speed yeah. test up. I mean, exactly. I'm hardwired. So but yeah, I yeah. still check so once in a while with my docking station. I'll look and I'm going like, wait a minute, I'm not getting full strength. You know, yeah. now I check before every time I teach and just you make sure to. I'm all good with uh, my signal. So. Yeah. And. So this is just so cool. I do want to. Well, first off, where can people we're not we'll keep talking for a few minutes, but I just want to make sure we say to people, where can they sign up for lessons? Where do you recommend they get in touch with you? Oh, you, you go to brucebecker.com and there's a there's a page that will send you to uh, uh, email me uh, and it'll come direct to me. Um, and then I respond and say, look, you know, I'll give my stock response. This is how I do. This is what I do. Uh, give me your best days and availabilities. Tell me what time zone you're in because, you know, the challenge is, and I've learned to really work with that because I lived in Europe, so I understand the value of different time signatures. Totally. I mean, uh, time signatures, uh, time, time zones. zones. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I know time signatures too, but time zones. <laughs> so yeah. I got it all worked out. I got a contingency of guys in the UK. I've got guys in, you know, in Germany, Belgium, Italy, uh, Switzerland. I've had a bunch of guys in the the uh, Scandinavian countries. Got guys in. I got a guy in Taiwan. A guy in New Zealand. I've had guys in Australia. I mean Israel, sure. India. You, you can name make it, it. Work. Yeah. Azerbaijan. <laughs> have a guy who was in uh, uh, Uruguay. Wow. Canada. So anyway, you just got to let me know what the time zone is, and I try to work. If I don't have a time, then you just wait. If you can hold on, but generally. The way things work, because I do every two weeks. I don't like to teach week to week, except okay. for the younger people that I have. I have a few people that are every week, but they're kids. Yeah. And kids can kind of roll with it faster. If it's an adult, uh, somebody who's working or has other things going on, I say two-week interval. But don't lose that two-week interval because we want to get traction. I want to be able to speak that same stuff over and over so that you're responding and you're going, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. So it's not always the physical nature, but it's the consistent conversation, which sure. helps to really build conceptual results. Yeah. So very cool. BrucePecker.com. I'll put the link in the description. People can see it there. Um, yeah. But, and, and this and, is my, this is my studio. And I'll yeah. just run you through real quick. I could just show you. Like, so I've got like, you know, I've got my foot cam. There's the foot cam. Yeah. We've got the overhead cam. Right. Nice. And then yeah. we've got just the straight up Bruce Becker face cam. And when I do my videos, I orchestrate everything to measure up to what we need to see and make sure, like I said, I get to the bullet points so that we're orchestrating the exercise from a, a point of let's hit bullseyes. Yeah. And maybe you're not hitting the bullseye, but you've got the straight diagram line of where you need to go. Sure. Very cool. And and you mentioned before doing some other promotional stuff and podcasts. I think you need to do one. Um, uh, there's a number of people who do them, but Mike da uh, Mike Dawson from Drum Candy comes to mind where you do a podcast interview with someone where, again, like I said, I love I'm a I feel I'm a good drummer. I know I am. But but there's guys like Mike who work every day on their rudimental practice. Oh, he's, yeah, you should do videos, yeah. an interview with someone like that who can run you more through the book, because I'm sure people are watching this going, you know, you guys didn't do more playing again. My thing is the history and all that stuff, but I would love to connect with with you with some other folks like that and help with sure. that. Um, oh, that'd be awesome, man! But social media, all that stuff, you know, you want to tell people where to find you there. Obviously, yeah, BruceBecker.com. So, right, uh, my YouTube channel is YouTube. I think it's slash Bruce Becker Drums, and then my Instagram is Bruce Becker Drums, and my Facebook page is just Bruce Becker. But then there's the fan page, which I haven't really interacted with a lot. But I get again, I think it's the same Bruce Becker Drums. Sure. And, um, you know, if you look me up and put Bruce Becker drum, you'll find and then I'm going to, I'm going to show up. I'm going to yeah, show up. I don't think I have there's any with, with this where it's like, people are like, well, what's your social media on? It's like, well, here it's drum history there. It's drum history underscore. It's like, just type in drums, hit drum history. You'll find. Yeah, it. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Bruce, it is always a pleasure to have you on here. I'm glad to have you as a friend in the industry and I'm glad you reached out to me to, to talk about your book. And I'm, I'm honored to get to like 
you know, be a place where people can hear about it. Because I think a lot of people who listen to the show really do love books and uh, and hearing from, a you know, a great teacher like you. So, uh, again, I appreciate you being on the show and hopefully we'll have you back again on your next great adventure. You know, the next thing you do down the thank road. You, Mark. Yeah, thank pre- you, Bruce. And I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate all that you do for the drum community as well. You've got some great interviews. If uh, people are seeing this interview for the first time or like something with Bart, go back and review, man. There's a bunch of great stuff, man. I go back and I go, oh, I I didn't see that one. And, <laughs> you know, I didn't I didn't know too much about it until about two and a half years ago. And then I started to follow. I think that uh, the guy Stone Custom Drums guy oh, was the first foray, and I went, "Bernie, wow, yeah, Bernie Stone." And I was like, "Wow, that was great story." And then I started to follow more, and uh, just thank you for uh, you know getting our, our knucklehead drummers out there to indulge and listen to just a bunch of drummers talking about great stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, brother. 